The Cybrarian presents Robert E. Howard's Conan The Devil in Iron Disclaimer The following may contain violence, references to sex, and language that may offend. Music by Solar Flare Images by Austin Nail, Sven Schuermeyer, and Pujitha Prasad. Chapter 1 The fisherman listened his knife in its scabbard. The gesture was instinctive, for what he feared was nothing a knife could slay. Not even the saw-edged crescent blade of the yet she knife that could disembowel a man with an upward stroke. Neither man nor beast threatened him in the solitude which brooded over the castellated isle of Zapur. He had climbed the cliffs, passed through the jungle that bordered them, and now stood surrounded by evidences of a vanished state. Broken columns glimmered among the trees. The straggling lines of crumbling walls meandered off into the shadows, and under his feet were broad paves, cracked and bowed by roots growing beneath. The fisherman was typical of his race, that strange people whose origin is lost in the grey dawn of the past, and who have dwelt in their rude fishing huts along the southern shore of the Sea of Villayette since time immemorial. He was broadly built, with long, apish arms and a mighty chest, but with lean loins and thin, bandy legs, his face was broad, his forehead low and retreating, his hair thick and tangled. A belt for a knife and a rag for a loincloth were all he wore in the way of clothing. That he was where he was proved that he was less dully and curious than most of his people. Men seldom visited Zapur. It was uninhabited, all but forgotten, merely one among the myriad isles which dotted the great inland sea. Men called it Zapur, the fortified, because of its ruins, remnants of some prehistoric kingdom lost and forgotten before the conquering Heborians had ridden southward. None knew who reared those stones, though dim legends lingered among the yet she which half intelligibly suggested a connection of immeasurable antiquity between the fishers and the unknown island kingdom. But it had been a thousand years since any yet she had understood the importance of these tales. They repeated them now as meaningless formula, a gibberish frame to the lips by custom. No yet she had come to Zapur for a century. The adjacent coast of the mainland was uninhabited, a reedy marsh given over to the grim beasts that haunted it. The fisher's village lay some distance to the south, on the mainland. A storm had blown its frail fishing craft far from its accustomed haunts and wrecked it in a night of flaring lightning and roaring waters on the towering cliffs of the isle. Now, in the dawn, the sky shone blue and clear. The rising sun made jewels of the dripping leaves. He had climbed the cliffs to which he had clung through the night because, in the midst of the storm, he had seen an appalling lance of lightning fork out of the black heavens, and the concussion of its stroke, which had shaken the whole island, had been accompanied by a cataclysmic crash that he doubted could have resulted from a riven tree. A dull curiosity had caused him to investigate, and now he had found what he sought. An animal-like uneasiness possessed him, a sense of lurking peril. Among the trees reared a broken, dome-like structure, built of the gigantic blocks of the peculiar iron-like green stone found only on the islands of Villayette. It seemed incredible that human hands could have shaped and placed them, and certainly it was beyond human power to have overthrown the structure they formed. But the thunderbolt had splintered the ton-heavy blocks like so much glass, reduced others to green dust, and ripped away the whole arch of the dome. The fisherman climbed over the debris and peered in, and what he saw brought a grunt from him. Huh? Within the ruined dome, surrounded by stone dust and bits of broken masonry, lay a man on a golden block. He was clad in a sort of skirt and a chagrin girdle. His black hair, which fell in a square mane to his massive shoulders, 
was confined about his temple by a narrow gold band. On his bare, muscular breast lay a curious dagger with a jewelled pommel and a chagrin-bound hilt and a broad crescent blade. It was much like the knife the fisherman wore at his hip, but it lacked the serrated edge and was made with an infinitely greater skill. The fisherman lusted for the weapon. The man, of course, was dead and had been dead for many centuries. This dome was his tomb. The fisherman did not wonder by what art the ancients had preserved the body in such a vivid likeness of life, which kept the muscular limbs full and unshrunken, the dark flesh vital. The dull brain of the yet she had room only for his desire for the knife, with its delicate, waving lines along the dully gleaming blade. Scrambling down into the dome, he lifted the weapon from the man's breast. As he did so, a strange and terrible thing came to pass. The muscular, dark hands knotted convulsively, the lids flared open, revealing great, dark, magnetic eyes, whose stare struck the startled fisherman like a physical blow. He recoiled, dropping the jeweled dagger in his perturbation. The man on the dais heaved up to a sitting position, and the fisherman gaped at the full extent of his size thus revealed. His narrowed eyes held the yet she, and in those slitted orbs he read neither friendliness nor gratitude. He saw only fire, as alien and hostile as that which burns in the eyes of a tiger. Suddenly the man rose and towered above him, menace in his every aspect. There was no room in the fisherman's dull brain for fear, at least for such fear as might grip a man who has just seen the fundamental laws of nature defied. As the great hands fell to his shoulders, he drew his saw-edge knife and struck upwards with the same motion. The blade splintered against the stranger's corded belly as against a steel column, and the fisherman's thick neck broke like a rotten twig in the giant's hands. Chapter 2 Jahangi Araga, Lord of Hawarizm, and Keeper of the Coastal Border, scanned once more the ornate parchment scroll with its peacock seal and laughed shortly and sardonically. Khul <laughs> bluntly demanded his counsellor, Ghaznavi. Jahangir shrugged his shoulders. He was a handsome man, with the merciless pride of birth and accomplishment. The king grows short of patience he said. In his own hand he complains bitterly of what he calls my failure to guard the frontier. By Tarim, if I cannot deal a blow to these robbers of the steppes, Khawarizm may own a new lord. Ghaznavi tugged his grey, short beard in meditation. Yezdigerd, king of Tehran, was the mightiest monarch in the world. In his palace, in his great port city of Agrapur, was heaped the plunder of empires. His fleets of purple-sailed war galleys had made Vilayet an Hyrcanian lake. The dark-skinned people of Zamora paid him tribute, as did the eastern provinces of Koth. The Shemites bowed to his rule as far west as Shashan. His armies ravaged the borders of Stygia in the south and the snowy lands of the Hyperboreans in the north. His riders bore torch and sword westward to Berthunia and Ophir and Corinthia, even to the borders of Nemedia. His gilt-helmeted swordsmen had trampled hosts under their horses' hooves, and walled cities went up in flames at his command. In the glutted slave markets of Agrapur, Sultanapur, Khwarizm, Shaipur and Horazun, women were sold for three small silver coins. Blonde Brythunians, tawny Stygians, dark-haired Zamorians, ebon Kushites, olive-skinned Shemites. Yet while his swift horsemen overthrew armies far from his frontiers, at his very borders an audacious foe plucked his beard with a red dripping and smoke-stained hand. On the broad steps between the Sea of Vilayet and the borders of the easternmost Heborian kingdoms, a new race had sprung up in the past half-century, formed originally of fleeing criminals, broken men, escaped slaves, and deserting soldiers. They were men of many crimes and countries, 
some born on the steppes, some fleeing from the kingdoms in the west. They were called Cossack, which means wastrel. Dwelling on the wild open steppes, owning no law but their own peculiar code, they had become a people capable even of defying the Grand Monarch. Ceaselessly, they raided the Turanian frontier, retiring in the steppes when defeated, with the pirates of Vilayet, men of much the same breed, they harried the coast, preying off the merchant ships which plied between the Hyrcanian ports. How am I to crush these wolves? demanded Jahungar. If I follow them into the steppes, I run the risk either of being cut off and destroyed, or of having them elude me entirely and burn the city in my absence. Of late they have been more daring than ever. That is because of the new chief who has risen among them, answered Ghaznavi. You know whom I mean. I, replied Jahangir feelingly, it is that devil Conan. He is even wilder than the Cossacks. Yet he is crafty as a mountain lion. It is more through wild animal instinct than through intelligence, answered Ghaznavi. The other Cossacks are at least descendants of civilized men. He is a barbarian. But to dispose of him would be to deal them a crippling blow. But how? demanded Jahangir. He has repeatedly cut his way out of spots that seem certain death for him. And, instinct or cunning, he has avoided or escaped every trap set for him. For every beast... And for every man, there is a trap he will not escape, quoth Gasnavi. When we have parlayed with the Cossacks for the ransom of captives, I have observed this man, Conan. He has a keen relish for women and strong drink. Have your captive Octavia fetched here. Jahangir clapped his hands, and an impressive Cushite eunuch, an image of shining ebony and silken pantaloons, bowed before him, and went to do his bidding. Presently he returned, leading by the wrist a tall, handsome girl whose yellow hair, clear eyes, and fair skin identified her as a pure-blooded member of her race. Her scanty silk tunic, girded at the waist, displayed the marvellous contours of her magnificent figure. Her fine eyes flashed with resentment, and her red lips were sulky, but submission had been taught her during her captivity. She stood with hanging head before her master until he motioned her to sit on the divan beside him. Then he looked inquiringly at Ghaznavi. We must lure Conan away from the Cossacks, said the counsellor abruptly. Their war camp is at present pitched somewhere on the lower reaches of Zaporaska River, which, as well you know, is a wilderness of reeds and swampy jungle, in which our last expedition was cut to pieces by those masterless devils. I am not likely to forget that, said Jahangir wryly. There is an uninhabited island near the mainland, said Ghaznavi, known as Zapur, the fortified, because of some ancient ruins upon it. There is a particularity about it which makes it perfect for our purposes. It has no shoreline but rises sheer out of the sea in cliffs a hundred and fifty feet tall. Not even an ape could negotiate them. The only place where a man can go up or down is a narrow path on the western side that has the appearance of a warm stair carved into the solid rock of the cliffs. If we could trap Conan on that island alone, we could hunt him down at our leisure, with bows as men hunt a lion. As well wish for the moon, said Jahangir impatiently. So we send him a messenger, bidding him climb the cliffs and await our coming. In effect, yes. Seeing Jahangir's look of amazement, Gasnavi continued, We will ask for parley with the Cossacks, in regard to prisoners, at the edge of the steps by Fort Gori. As usual, we will go with the force and encamp outside the castle. They will come with an equal force, and the parley will go forward 
with the usual distrust and suspicion. But this time, we will take with us, as if by a casual chance, your beautiful captive. Octavia changed colour and listened with intensified interest as the counsellor nodded towards her. She will use all her wiles to attract Conan's attention. That should not be difficult. To that wild river, she should appear a dazzling vision of loveliness. Her vitality and substantial figure should appear to him more vividly than would one of the doll-like beauties of your seraglio. Octavia sprang up, her white fists clenched, her eyes blazing, and her figure quivering with outraged anger. You would force me to play the trap with this barbarian, she exclaimed. I will not. I am no market blood slut to smirk and ogle at a steps robber. I am the daughter of a Nemedian lord. You were of the Nemedian nobility before my riders carried you off, returned Jahangar cynically. Now you are merely a slave who will do as she has bid. I will not, she raged. On the contrary, rejoined Jahangar with studied cruelty. You will. I like Gaznavi's plan. Continue, prince among my counsellors. Conan will probably wish to buy her. You will refuse to sell her, of course, or to exchange her for Harkanian prisoners. He may then try to steal her or take her by force, though I do not think even he would break the parley truce. Anyway, we must be prepared for whatever he might attempt. Then, shortly after the parley, before he has time to forget all about her, we will send a messenger to him under a flag of truce, accusing him of stealing the girl and demanding her return. He may kill the messenger, but at least he will think that she has escaped. We will then send a spy, a Yutishi fisherman will do, to the Cossack camp who will tell Conan that Octavia is hiding on Zapur. If I know my man, he will go straight to that place. But we do not know that he will go alone, Jahangir argued. Does a man take a band of warriors with him when going to a rendezvous with a woman he desires, retorted Gaznavi. The chances are all that he will go alone. But we will take care of the other alternative. We will not await him on the island, where we might be trapped ourselves, but among the reeds of a marshy point, which juts out to within 1,000 yards of Sapur. If he brings a large force, we'll beat a retreat and think up another plot. If he comes alone or with a small party, we will have him. Depend upon it, he will come, remembering your charming slave's smiles and meaning glances. I will never descend to such shame. Octavia was wild with fury and humiliation. I will die first. You will not die, my rebellious beauty, said Jahangir, but you will be subjected to a very painful and humiliating experience. He clapped his hands and Octavia appalled. This time it was not the Kushite who entered, but a Shemite, a heavy muscled man with a short curled blue-black beard. Here is work for you, Gilzan, said Jahangir. Take this fool and play with her a while, yet be careful not to spoil her beauty. With an inarticulate grunt, the Shemite seized Octavia's wrist, and at the grasp of his iron fingers, all the defiance went out of her. With a piteous cry, she tore away and threw herself on her knees before her implacable master, sobbing incoherently for mercy. Jahangir dismissed the disappointed torturer with a gesture and said to Ghaznavi, If your plan succeeds, I will fill your lap with gold. Thank you for listening. Please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.